All right, let's take a look at a more complicated one, but a really important one, the reentrancy attack. This is the type of attack that was used to create the first really big disaster on Ethereum. When Ethereum came out, the whole reason why Ethereum existed, why it was better than Bitcoin, is because you could put these programs on the, on the blockchain. And after a year or more of trumpeting this and getting people to invest in everything, they rolled out the DAO, the Digital Autonomous Organization, which was going to be the on-blockchain company that would prove that Ethereum was fantastic. And it turned out to have a fatal flaw and immediately got hacked. There were $100 million in it and somebody stole about $30 million. And the developers of the DAO went to Ethereum and said, please roll back the blockchain and cancel the last week of transactions so we can undo this. And they said, we are not going to do that. We would compromise the integrity of the blockchain. And the fact that you wrote a crappy application to run on the blockchain is not our problem. So the so-called white hat hackers repeated the attack and stole all the rest of the money. So now 100 million was gone. And that turned out to humiliate the Ethereum blockchain maintainers enough that they did roll back the blockchain and fork Ethereum. And there's now two kinds of Ethereum, one where the DAO got hacked and another where the DAO didn't get hacked. And there was a split later, so there's actually four kinds of Ethereum. Um, and when I first heard that, I thought that was terrible and insane. But the fact is, the same thing happened to the stock exchange twice that I know of. The London Stock Exchange had to do that around 2008 or so, when um, Microsoft convinced the stock exchange to move to Windows instead of Linux. And Windows crashed so badly that they had to roll back two or three days of trades. And it happened to the New York Stock Exchange when program trading first hit, and everybody was easily able to program sell if you hit a certain point and it caused a certain, it made the system incredibly unstable. So when something fluctuated, everybody sold all at once and made everything crash. And again, they rolled back a couple of days of transactions and just had a do over. So the people who made money didn't get the money. So like I say, I, I've, I used to be really down on cryptocurrency projects and say this stuff is horrible. But uh, one of the defenses is that the real stock exchange and banks and everything we use is also crazy, and that's a pretty good argument. So anyway, <clears throat> here is a simplified version of the um, re-entrancy attack. And here's how it works. You have a way to um, invest money and a way to remove money in the contract, but of course there are restrictions. You can only remove a certain amount and only as much as you own and so on. But what you can do is when you get money sent to your contract, this is a bizarre feature of solidity. If you send money from your contract into my contract, I don't just receive money. What happens is it runs my receive function. And I can make, if I don't just run one, it'll run the fallback function. And the point is that can contain executable code. So just receiving money from your contract gives me the ability to execute code on your contract. That is insane. But that is the way Solidity worked. So... They were able, every time I receive money, it will now call another withdraw before this one is finished. So if your code doesn't check to see if I've withdrawn too much until after this transaction succeeds, I can run many copies of this transaction before you ever reach the line that'll tell you I've withdrawn too much. That is the flaw in the contract. If you do the operations in the wrong order and you don't understand that re-entrancy is an option, if you send me money, I could immediately call your function while you're doing that. And that's how it works. So we're going to do one that shows this. It's going to be the Ether store contract. And the way they've set it up to make it easy, this is like a, a, a gift that you would get, like some kind of reward for being like a loyal customer or something. We're going to have some limited number of gifts that customers can get. And then the attacker is going to exceed that limit. So this is the rewards.sol contract. Let's see. I think I'll paste it in because even if it's here, it would probably be a version that's been patched because we're going to get it working, hack it, and then patch it. So I go to Berlin and back to London to get a clean blockchain. Now I go to my contracts and here's rewards. I'm just going to erase the old rewards and paste in the code again to make sure I got the correct code. All right. It's not letting me select at all, which is weird. Ah, control A works. All right, good. All right, so now I paste in my code. All right, so this is the rewards contract. It's got a function to allow gifts, which will authorize some gifts and then a way to withdraw gifts. And um, 
Uh, all right. And if gifts are still greater than zero, then you get one. And then I decrement gifts. This is the withdraw function that takes a gift. So, all right, you can only take a gift if there are some more authorized gifts remaining. And every time you take one, I decrement gifts by one. So that's the logic the developer intended here. And if you don't have anybody re-entering, it works fine. So let's deploy this. There's a rewards contract. So I compile it. All right, it compiled okay. Now I deploy it. And there are two contracts. There's a reward contract, which is, and then there's an attacker contract, which is going to attack it. Right now, I just want to put up the rewards contract and deploy that. So it puts it on the simulated blockchain. And now I have operations I can put in down here. So if I'm going to allow some gifts, let me just go to my instructions and make sure I'm on track. I think I allow two gifts, but let's see. All right. Um, we deploy it. We deploy the. And then we um, fund the reward contract. So I put in 20 Ether and deposit. OK. So first, I have to give it some Ether. All right. So I've got 100 Ether approximately. I can give it 20. 20, I say. 20 Ether. All right. And now I deposit that. The transaction succeeds. My balance falls to 80 Ether, so 20 Ether went somewhere. So I did apparently be able to put some funds in. Okay, now I'm going to check the balance, and it should have 20, and then allow two gifts. All right, let's check the balance, which is 20 times 10 to the 18. Looks good. Now I'm going to allow some gifts. So it is two, allow gifts, and then she examine the gifts. Okay, so I'm going to. Uh, I have 20 in there. I'm going to authorize giving away two of them. That transaction succeeds. Now, if I look at gifts, it's two. So there are now two specified to be given away to people who want them. All right. <coughs> now I withdraw a gift. All right. So um, my balance has fallen to 80 or so because I gave away, tw put 20 in the contract. Now I'm going to try and take a gift. I'm going to withdraw a gift, and the transaction succeeds. So my balance goes up to 81. This looks good. So I got a gift, and the number of gifts that are available went down to one. So everything's working fine. Now I think I'm going to withdraw a second and try to withdraw a third to make sure that the limit is working. So now I withdraw again, and it succeeds. And now there's zero gifts left. And now my balance is 82. Now I'm going to try to withdraw another one. And the transaction appears to have succeeded. But my balance did not go up. So it um, ran successfully. It went in here. But this if statement was not true. So it just exited without doing anything. It didn't print out an error message or revert the transaction or anything. It just ran, but it did not give me a gift. So the code is working as expected. Now. We're going to hack it. So first, we need to allow two more gifts because there have to be some allowed. So I'm going to hit all gifts again for two. OK. So now there's two gifts permitted. And the balance is now down to 18 because I did withdraw two gifts. So now somebody could take two gifts. And now I'm going to steal 10 Ether. So um, to do that, I need to use the attacker's contract. And to deploy the attacker contract, I need an address, just like ones we've done before. So here's the rewards contract, and here's the attacker contract. And when you deploy the attacker contract, you have to give it the address of the rewards contract. So let's look at the, here's the attacker contract. It has a parameter, rewards. And when you does a construction, the constructor calls the rewards. So that's why it has to know what it's attacking. This contract, it connects to the other contract, and now, it has a fallback function, which in this version of Solidity, you have no name on. So when somebody sends me money, it's going to do this, and it's going to do another withdraw operation up to 10 times. So you send, well, I withdraw one, and before that transaction is completed, it's going to initiate nine more withdrawals. So that's all it does to work. So now I have to deploy it. I need the address of the rewards contract. 
and then deploy the attacker contract with the address as a parameter. And it worked. I got a green check mark. So now I have an attacker contract here. So now I can steal money and put it in any account. So let's take the second account here with 100 Ether, just to make it easy to see what happens. And now we're going to attack. And the transaction finishes. And now, I um, hmm, thought my account would grow greatly. Yeah, I wonder what I did wrong. Um, oh, look at this. The allowable gifts rolled over and became a negative number, which turns out to be a huge positive number. And the balance fell by 10. That's right. I remember this. We have seen this before. It worked. It stole 10 coins, but they didn't go to my account. They went to the account of the attacker contract which is the same thing we saw before. So they're now under my control. And what I should have done, which I'm not sure I did in this demonstration, is when I write the attacker contract, I also give myself a withdraw function to take the money out of it after it steals. When you steal the money, it goes to the attacking contract. And then you have to add a function to take it back to yourself from that. And I think that's this get balance not See, I, I don't know if I put one in here for me to collect the money from the attacker contract, but I did show that, did show that we've stolen 10. Yeah, okay. And now... So to fix the um, <clears throat> the vulnerability, you can do address send, address transfer, or address call value. These are three ways to send money. And one thing, this is the one that we used here. And the problem, if you think about it, there's one defense against this, which is you can use a function which sends money and limits the total amount of gas available for that transaction. And that means it can't repeat the transaction many times because it'll run out of gas. So if you used one of these, it would not be able to do so much re-entrance, maybe none at all, because it would just run out of gas. That's one defense against this. And so that's one way to do it using one of the other methods. But of course, a simpler one is just reorganize the lines of code. As we said before, um, you can fix the vulnerability by making it look like this. So let me bring my remix into a separate window so I can see both of these at once. All right. All right, so you go to the contract and it is this withdraw function, okay? What I do is instead of subtracting one after sending it, I take this line and cut it and put it here. And then I'll unindent it. Just, I don't think the indentation is mandatory, but it looks better. All right, and there. So now, every time you withdraw, the first thing I do is subtract one from the allowed gifts. And then if there's one left, you get it. So that's, um, and now it would be if gift less than 1,000 instead of zero, because if you subtracted from zero, it would now be minus one. And that would be a huge positive number. So this test will fail if you have a huge positive number like a negative number. All right, that's all I do. Now I need to recompile and redeploy it. So let's clean off these old deployed contracts. I don't want to use them anymore. Go back to the compiler and compile it. It's compiled. Now go to the deployer and deploy the rewards. That worked. Now I need the address of rewards. Now I deploy the attacker at that address. That also worked. Okay, now, I think if I repeat the attack, um, yeah, fund it with 20 and approve two gifts, yep, and perform the attack. So let's see how it looks. Um, I think I can make this big again. All right, so I fund it with ether, give it 20 ether. All right, and that's deposit. And now I allow two gifts. And now it has 17 ether and uh, two gifts. All right, I'm not quite sure why the number of ether is different than before, but I'm not going to worry about it. All right, so um, I've, I've got two gifts. Now I'm going to attempt to attack it down here. Um, my balance is zero. 
and here's that count. All right, now I'm going to run this attack. The transaction succeeded, but my balance did not go up. And uh, all right, let me see from. All right, and I, yep, gifts is two. Perform the attack, yep. And then you'll find something in a log. So anyway, um, it didn't let me do the re-entrance, although I thought I should have gotten at least some gifts. So I think I must have fouled up my demonstration a little bit. I should have got the two I was allowed to get and no more. But um, anyway, that's the, uh, the idea. This is how you, one of the many ways to patch it. And that's a really important vulnerability. So I'm going to stop this one.